Good morning. My name is Tim Albright, and welcome to uh, this 4K ses session. Uh, we're going to talk about 4K UHD streaming, uh, definitions, challenges, and champions. Uh, I'm going to moderate the panel. With us is uh, Melissa Dillman. Melissa is the Director of Training and Education for Kramer. Uh, Justin Kennington. Justin is the Technology Manager of Digital Media for Crestron Electronics. And finally, Thomas Edwards is the VP of Engineering and Development for Fox Networks. Uh, I'm going to go through some slides here real quick. Um, if anybody has a question or anything or wants to make a comment, please just raise your hand and say, hey. We're going to have some questions at the end. Uh, OK, so we're going to do introductions. I'm going to let each of the, of the panelists kind of uh, introduce themselves and, and say what their experience is. Uh, we're going to go over some basic 4K uh, and UHD resolutions, talk a little bit about over-the-air broadcast, uh, because that's where we get some of our, our math from, talk about the network infrastructure. Uh, and then finally, we're going to wrap it up with how we, we are actually going to stream 4K. Uh, and then we're going to have some, some questions and answers. Uh, first, Thomas, introduce yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Thomas Edwards, a VP Engineering Development at Fox. I'm in Network Engineering and Operations, which is the distribution arm of Fox's uh, television properties in the United States, both broadcast and cable. I'm in an advanced technology group, and our goal is to try to think about what's coming down the pike in terms of future technology and how it's going to affect our business. Uh, so I'll say I was one of the I was a first generation internet video streamer back in the 20th century. Uh, you know I started out with CUC Me and uh, M Bone and uh, Real Video and Net Show and that stuff all first started and had a great time with that. Then the dot com boom happened. Had to go get a real job. Went into television. Uh, they've turned me into a broadcast engineer, and uh, now uh, 14 years later, back at Streaming Media East from the last time I was here. Now, of course, OTT is becoming real. It's beginning to pay the bills, and we're starting to get serious about it. And so that's why I'm here. All right, very good. Uh, Justin? I'm Justin Kennington. Uh, I run a product line called Digital Media for Crestron Electronics. Uh, digital Media is a system for distributing uh, digital audio and video content, uh, primarily in commercial, residential, uh, facility networks. Uh, we do it over baseband technologies like HDMI and HDBase-T, uh, but also over Ethernet networks uh, using H.264, HEVC encode, decode, uh, and those sorts of technologies. Okay. And Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Dillman. I'm with Kramer Electronics. I'm the Director of Training and Education. Um, my job is solely to teach um, technologies to the industry, primarily in the professional AV industry. So one of the things that uh, I work on is staying current with what the latest trends are and trying to help those who are doing it in the professional AV industry um, be prepared and better educated so that they can do the correct solutions. So that's what I do. Okay. All right, let's go over some, some basic resolutions here, good. I, first of all, everybody understands what HD is, right? What is HD? Well, I can tell you what HD is. Okay. HD is 720p 60 or 720p 50 in other countries, and it's 1080i uh, uh, 60 or 1080i 50, depending on what countries you're on. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, 1080p 24, which is a format used in uh, you know, downloadable programs and uh, some, me some solid media, uh, but it's generally not broadcast anywhere that I'm aware of. Right, notice what he said. He, what the an answer to the question is, there's three, four, they count five resolutions. With, with different well, there are three. There, there are two resolutions. There's, 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 there's 1080p 10, 10, 10, 10, and there's 720p. Sorry, it's 1080i. You're right, three. 1080i, 1080p, 1080p, 720p, and there are you know 50, 50 hertz or you know uh, or uh, 59.94 hertz depending on where you are. Yeah. So we have the same problem with UHD and 4K. Um, when uh, real quickly, the, the CEA, uh, the Consumer, Consumer Electronics Association, has advised. Uh, their members, which those are the people who make the consumer electronics products, the TVs, the VCR, the VCRs, good Lord, <laughs> DVD players, Blu-ray players and such, um, they've advised them when they're marketing their 4K quote-unquote products, they've asked them to use the term UHD 4K or 4K UHD. <clears throat> this causes some problems and some, uh, some issues in, uh, in the general populace, to be honest about it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of those resolutions and then we're going to talk about um, what those mean for you when it comes down to streaming. So we've got HD, we, we do have 720 as well as um, 1920, 1080. UHD, technically you've got two or three different versions of this. Uh, one of the more 
common or accepted ones, you get 3840 by 2160. You have 4K native. Uh, let's call 4K native 4096 by 2160. Uh, you do have what's called ultra wide, and notice that that has a 5 in the front of that number. So technically, you could call that 5K. Notice where we're going with this. 5K, which is 5120 by 2160, uh, and you do have some folks doing stuff down to 2K, which is 2048 1080. Now, um, for you guys, and, and Thomas, we'll start with you on this. When it comes to terminology, what is it that, that Fox calls 4K? Well, so I'll start off by saying that on the television side, Fox has no commercial plans for 4K or ultra high depth okay. or anything along those lines. That could change tomorrow, but I can say right now we have no ongoing forward commercial plans. On the other side of our lot, the people who make feature films, uh, they use the term UHD. Uh, in fact, we're one of the leaders in the UHD alliance. Uh, and that's, that's uh, generally uh, 3840 by 2160, as defined by the ITU, as defined by SMPT as uh, UHD TV1. So that's, the good news is I think we're going from a couple of different formats, including interlaced, to pretty much a single UHD format, that UHD TV1, the 3840 by 2160. Interlace is dead going forward, thank God. And, yes. and I think we've got one now. Of course, there'll be different frame rates depending on your regions, and uh, you know, we're still working some of that out. But uh, the resolution of UHD is pretty much there. 4K native, what's on the screen, and 2K, those are generally only going to be used within digital cinema. Um, in terms of those particular resolutions. Uh, it's not relevant to television. Of course, for streaming, you use whatever resolution you want to, but we would suggest you might want to use the, the television resolutions to fit into the rest of the pro professional production workflows. Right. Justin, what does uh, Crestron consider 4K? Uh, so for us, uh, as, as distribution infrastructure, the name of the game is to be able to handle whatever the users throw at us. Uh, we do tend in our, in our literature to refer to 4K very broadly as, uh, as any of these resolutions. Uh, I tend to define it as res a, a series of resolutions around 4,000 pixels wide by around 2,000 pixels tall. Uh, and my product's job is to, is to handle any of those things. Um, I'll echo the, the first comments here, though, uh, that just sort of the, the economics of manufacturing TVs these days dictate that Everything you see, I think, in reality is going to be 3840 by 2160. Uh, the 4096s and 2048s are uh, relegated to that digital cinema area. Um, so when I refer to 4K, I'm referring to it quite broadly, uh, but I think practically what we'll see are displays uh, at this UHD resolution. Okay, Melissa? So when I'm teaching 4K, I teach based on um, what CE says, the Consumer Electronics Association, what they're saying. Um, but one of my primary jobs is to make sure that people understand 4K is um, a multiple things based on the marketing of it. So one of the things I try to teach is to make sure that you're investigating clearly what the manufacturer means or the marketing department means by 4K. You have to dig a little deeper into the, to the specifications to make sure you're getting what you expect that you're getting because um, there are so many different <coughs> variances in there. All right. Uh, in our discussion, when we were talking about this panel, uh, Thomas came up with a couple of really uh, rules of thumb, actually, literally, rules of thumb. Uh, we're going to show those two slides real quick and yep. kind of let's, explain let's to folks what we got. The first so one. We're going to need a volunteer in the front row. Can someone in the front row, would you like to be a volunteer on this? He laughed. I think he volunteered. I think he's, yeah, he's, he's my buddy, too. So can you, can you help us out here? Hold up, hold up your thumb at the end of your, at the end of your arm and uh, put it up against the screen. So does your thumb uh, cover the entire screen or, or more or less? Less. A little bit less. So can you stand up and get a little bit closer until it covers the entire screen from top to bottom? As closer. I'm doing, yeah, closer, get closer. Yeah. Just step up, get closer. <laughs> Enti like I've never until your entire thumb again. covers the, from top to bottom. Not gonna have keep, keep going, okay. keep going. No, I think you're too close now. You got, sorry, you got to back up. So it's precisely from the top to the bottom. Okay, so right about there. That is, my rule of thumb is that's about three picture heights. Now, obviously, it's plus or minus a bit depending on your genetics and the situation. No, no, wait, no, you're not done with you no. yet. Okay, <laughs> he is at three picture heights. That is the distance from the screen. You need to be able to see HD resolution. Now, will you please you put two thumbs up and approach the screen and let, stop when your two thumbs cover uh, the top to the bottom of the screen. Like this. Yeah, like that, right? And yeah, there you go. Just keep going and stop when you stop when you get there. Right about 
right about there. Right about there. Yeah, I, I did this earlier, so I think he's doing it right. That is 1.5 picture heights. That's the distance from the screen you will need to be able to see uh, ultra high def, or four, I should say specifically 4K resolution. Uh, most people in their houses are not at 1.5 picture heights. In fact, a lot of people are not at three picture heights. A lot of people can't even see the HD resolution that we're delivering today. So this is going to be a bit of a challenge with 4K, is a lot of people are going to be too far away from their screen to actually see the full 4K resolution. So I encourage you, when you go home at night, try my rule of thumb and see how far away you are from, the, from, your, from your television screen. Mm -hmm. You're done yes, now. You're Thank, done. Thank you very, very much. much. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> All right, real quick, we're going to uh, go into uh, sidestep this for a little bit and, and go into broadcast for just a slight second. Um, and, and Thomas, we'll lean on you on this one because not only do you, we need to talk about 4K over the air, we need to talk about the next step over the air. Um, how are we delivering, not we, how are you guys delivering 4K and, and the, next, uh, the next resolution up? Well, so, so I can say we're not delivering. Well, then you're not. Now. You're not delivering. How is the industry? I should. The say. industry. Well, I can say so. Uh, Fox Film Entertainment is a member of the UHD Alliance, and they've made a conclusion that right now streaming bit rates, uh, even over the air bit rates, do not. Uh, they're not high enough to deliver 4K resolution today. Now, my my the Edwards rule of compression is you can always make it look like crap by not putting enough bits on it. Uh, but the, the truth is, is that they feel, uh, you know, the kind of uh, speeds we get today, you know, Akamai will tell you the average internet connectivity in the U.S. is about 11 megabits per second. That's not good enough for 4K, uh, especially for the feature films that Fox Film Entertainment makes great things like Life of Pi. They don't want to make this stuff look like crap. They want to make it look good. So what Fox Film Entertainment is doing is they will deliver uh, 4K resolution materials using uh, downloads, not streams, but downloads, through the Secure Content Storage Association secure hardware devices. And these will be built into televisions, and these will be also available separate set-top boxes. And also, towards the end of the year, they'll be releasing ultra-high-def Blu-ray, which will also be capable of delivering uh, the bit rate uh, to have high-quality, ultra-high-def movies. And not only will it be ultra-high-def in resolution, it will be high dynamic range luminance, and it will be a wider color gamut than is, than is delivered by television today. So that's, those are the, the three touchstones of uh, the UHD Alliance. Uh, not only higher resolution, but even you know, better pixels as well. How then, if we are taking, we're creating that, we're getting that then to the displays directly? Or is that, just, is that also through the set-top boxes that you mentioned? Well, in other words, you'll download the files onto a device, either inside your television mm -hmm. or outside your television. And then uh, if it's outside your television, you'll probably be able to use HDMI 2 to get to your, to get to your television. Or, you know, from inside your television, obviously, it's already You said already HDMI there. 2, not you, as in the number 2, not HDMI 2 as in also. No, yeah, yeah. Just want to make sure. Yeah, <laughs> I yes, want to yes. clarify the which version yeah. of HDMI. And actually, it may be 2.1. I'm, I'm not an HDMI expert. But clearly, with the newest version of HDMI, you'll be able to deliver this. They decided to go with 2.0a. 2.0a, OK, good. Add, good. Add some alphanumeric to it to keep things interesting. <laughs> yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, so from content creators, uh, a content creator's standpoint and point of view, um, we're not looking then at necessarily quote unquote streaming, correct? Is that what I'm understanding here? Is that we're not physically going to stream, we're going to download? Well I, I can, uh, well, I can tell you again, Fox Film Entertainment has made the decision at this point, streaming bit rate is not there. So let me, let me just talk about yeah. bit rate for a second. Uh, so you know, we, we have examples of 4K cable channels out there in the world. In South Korea, Home Choice has a 4K cable channel. It runs about 32 megabits per second with HEVC encoding. The BBC World Cup trials, they have been about 30 to 35 megabits per second. Um, and also some work recently has been done uh, with the ITU. Uh, they took a look at a bunch of different types of content. Uh, again, this is all uh, 4K 60p material. Uh, and they found out of 10 different clips, uh, four of them actually compressed well at 15 megabits per second. So look, there, are, there is content. Obviously, if nothing's moving in the screen or if everything's black, right? If it's a very simple scene, you can get 15 megabits per second. However, that was only 40% of their, their clips. Another 40% of their clips took 30 megabits per second 
to, to look good. And when I say good, achieving a mean opinion score of four out of five in subjective testing. And this, this isn't PSNR, this isn't SSIM. These are real human beings sitting in, watching this at 1.5 picture heights and indicating what their mean opinion score is. Then, so that, that's 40% need 30 megabits per second. Then there are two clips out of these 10 that even at 40 megabits per second, did not achieve a four mean opinion score. It only achieved a three mean, opi mean opinion score. And this uh, correlates with some things from the folks I've talked with at Fox Film Entertainment where when they're thinking about Ultra HD Blu-ray rates and they say, oh my God, some scenes, I, I almost need as much as I can get out of the Ultra HD Blu-ray, which is gonna be in the 100 megabit per second department for some particular scenes. So we can see that on, on average, these bit rates are gonna be in the 30s for right now. Now, we're right now running on software encoders for HEVC 4K. By 2017, there will be hardware encoders for 4K. I've been told by knowledgeable people, the rates may drop down into the 20s, uh, but it's unlikely to get below 20 if you really want to have something like the NFL in 4K and yeah. have it look good. It's probably going to be in, in the low 20s by 2017, 2018. Uh, so it is possible, I'd say by 2020, given the, 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 uh, rate, the rate of increase of end user bandwidth uh, for internet usage, uh, we could get to a point where people have 20 megabits per second to the home on average, and right about then we'll have 4K at about 20 megabits per second in HEVC. So I think by 2020, there may be an opportunity for live streaming. But that, again, this is my, my prediction, does not represent uh, oh, Fox no. Film Entertainment or Absolutely. 20th Century Fox. All right, Melissa, Thomas made a, a couple comments there about compression, about, you know, algorithms, you take a, uh, a 4K signal and you compress it down, are you not losing some of that, some of that signal? Well, with, with the better encoders, so certainly now that we're talking 265, um, newer encoders, I'm sure that'll be coming down the line, we're able to salvage a lot of that. Um, for us, what we're talking about here is the bottom line becomes, how are you gonna get it to my display? because that's primarily where we're concerned, mm. um, is how are you gonna get it to the display? So again, with the marketing behind 4K, um, we suggest that you do the simple math. And the simple math is to verify what do you need in order to pass that signal. And a lot of times what you're gonna find is that the HDMI just isn't gonna be fast enough. The pipe's not large enough for you to get the signal through that you think you, or that your client thinks that they're getting. So um, we certainly, that, that's the big thing, is look at the math behind this and make sure that you can pass that signal. Otherwise, we are gonna start losing a lot of, of critical information. Justin, you guys have a number of streamers as well that take this information. Is that what you guys are using as the H.264, or what are you guys using? Uh, our, the generation of products we have today are live 264 okay. encoders and decoders. I think compression really sits at the heart of, of everything we need to do. Obviously, the, the broadcast guys, have to do that. They have to live with 11 megabits per second to the home. Um, what I do today is based on either purpose-built, uh, dedicated video infrastructure that's uncompressed, yeah. uh, or when it is compressed, it needs to live on a well-managed sort of corporate IT infrastructure. Now that's an easier problem than last mile delivery to the home, uh, but it's still a challenge. And we live in this world uh, where we're getting more and more pixels. You know, here we're talking about 4K today. Five and 10 years from now, we can be having conversations about 8K. So we got more and more pixels, uh, but as Tom mentioned, those pixels are getting bigger as we move to wider color gamuts, as we move to high dynamic range. Uh, so you've got this you know, Moore's Law problem. The, the bit rates are, are exploding exponentially. More pixels, bigger pixels, there you go. Whereas real physical infrastructure uh, doesn't move according to, to Moore's Law. That's for silicon and transistors, not for pieces of real cable in the world. Uh, so the, the only solution I see to that problem long term is, is improved compression algorithms uh, and a broader rollout uh, of compression algorithms, not only in the broadcast and to the home world, uh, but in, in the case of, of sort of local uh, audio video distribution. Right. Something's got to give. Something does. It, it, Thomas, and, and I'm going to kind of mess with Justin's head for a second here. Uh, Justin may, mentioned 8K. Um, real briefly, Thomas, uh, tell us kind of what you told, tell them what you told us about some things, uh, some kind of exciting things that are happening in 8K. Yeah, so if 4K isn't enough pixels for you, uh, 8K is something that's being pioneered by uh, NHK in Japan. How many thumbs do we need? For <laughs> that would be, be four? four thumbs. 
okay? So uh, half, one, one half of the picture height approximately is, is the, the viewing distance for 8K. Uh, if you'd like to see it, uh, there will be pu some uh, public demos uh, in uh, Los Angeles and in New York during the Women's World Cup, which is occurring in Canada. Uh, NHK will be bringing back HK, 8K um, uh, video to uh, locations uh, in those two cities. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a lot of bits, uh, but certainly I've seen 8K streaming uh, on a, basically like a movie projector size screen at the NHK uh, headquarters in Tokyo. And I tell you, it's, it's awesome, but you really do need a screen that's like about the size of a, of a movie theater screen to really fully appreciate it. But it's like you're, you know, they had this um, video of uh, Shibuya crossing and I felt like I was there because the people were as tall as me and, I, the, and it was just like being uh, there in reality. It was amazing. So. The 8K is coming, and they, they tell us by 2020 in Japan, they'll have 8K broadcasts, and we'll, we'll have to see what happens. And we'll have to have another discussion about how to stream 8K. So, all right, uh, let's get down in, into kind of the, the, the basics of, of compression and a little bit more in, into the delivery. Uh, Justin, you mentioned the infrastructure doesn't move. What then do we need? Is it just the, the basic, you know, more and better compression, or, or what, what can we do to... I guess, um, increase our own infrastructure? Well, certainly infrastructure does move. It doesn't move at the rate of digital electronics. Um, so we see uh, in broadband terms, uh, we see that rate of you know, average internet speed to the home crawls up over time as, as the basic technologies that provide that improve. Um, in terms of local, local land infrastructure and building infrastructure, uh, we, two things happen. Number one, Cable plants are improved. You know, we go from Category 3 20 years ago to Category 5. Maybe people pull Category 6 cable now and, and more fiber optic vertical links. Uh, but we also see improvements in the electronics that drive those cables. There's this other industry who says, well, people want to do this on the Category 5 cable that's already in the wall, so we're going to have to figure out ways to shove more bits down that cable. So the, so the DSPs in the, in the physical layer electronics uh, improve. This is how we can get 10 gigabit Ethernet signals over, over category cables uh, and older category cables today. Um, so there is that movement, uh, but again, when it comes to this exponential increase in, in raw video data rates, the, the, the on the wire rates of number of pixels times bits per pixel, um, the infrastructure just doesn't keep up. So that's where compression comes in. Uh, and, then, and then we have to start making intelligent choices about which compression to use in the broadcast uh, side of, of the house, uh, obviously the the in interframe codecs, 264s and HEVCs of the world are the most efficient. And I think in, in the broadcast case, sort of bandwidth efficiency is probably the most uh, important feature of a codec. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm trading that off against latency. Um, whereas in the world of I want to use a computer mouse on that TV screen over there, uh, my latency requirements are very different, and now things like HEVC may no longer be appropriate. I may need uh, a JPEG 2000 uh, or similar intra-frame codec uh, that's going to be much less efficient. It's going to use a lot more bandwidth, uh, but isn't going to pay the same latency penalties uh, as the MPEG type codecs. All right, Thomas, you're over there shaking your head. Take us back to your, your days at Real Network. You know, um, <laughs> do you remember 20 kilobit per second dial-up video? I, and you I know, do. If nothing was moving in the, in the frame, it looked really good. Yes. Uh, so, so I'll say, you know, we, we actually uh, stream uh, IP video for our production now. Uh, for the first time, uh, a major sports event, a college basketball game, was produced uh, by an IP-routed truck. Uh, and gen and, you know, so when we do production, we're moving uncompressed video around. And until very recently, this has only been on uh, coaxial cable using a specialized uh, SMPTE uh, uh, system called uh, SDI, the Serial Digital Interface. Uh, but this spring, uh, Fox Sports built a new production truck with Game Creek uh, that used IP-based uh, switch in the center, a 10 gigabit Ethernet switch from Everts. Um, and uh, this uh, allowed, the, uh, allowed us to route uncompressed video over IP. And again, this is HD video, not 4K video yet, but the 1.5 gigabit per second HD video was, uh, was routed by the switch. Now, all the endpoint devices are still on SDI, so we have rack top converters that have fiber 10 gig E coming in, and then their SDI coax to the end devices. But pretty soon, these will all be native IP devices just hanging off of 10 gigabit Ethernet. 
And of course, we know by the end of the year, there'll be uh, one lane, 25 gigabit ethernet switches coming online. And what's nice about that is you can fit uncompressed 4K 60P into 25 gigabit ethernet into a single connection. So we won't need to use multiple 10 gigs or 40 gigs, which is really just four lanes of 10 gig in, inside. Uh, one, one last thing to, to cover before we start answering questions, uh, and that's you know, a, a color rate. Um, full 4K is, is, is a 444, right? When you start compressing, you start taking some of those numbers away. Melissa, what's, I guess, what's the rule of thumb, uh, to use Thomas's phrase, on the lowest uh, amount of, of, of color ratio you can have? Well, I mean, you can have whatever, whatever you can obviously get. 444 is the holy grail. Yeah. That's what we're all looking for. Um, don't know that we're necessarily going to see that, certainly due to the compression rates and, and trying to move this stuff around. Um, but that is what everybody's looking for. Again, the marketing can get very confusing because there are some who will claim that they're doing this or that, and you have to look closer and make sure that you know what what compression rates and uh, what color you're getting. HDR, the high dynamic range, that's really while 4K is the buzzword, I think the high dynamic high dynamic range is really what's the customer is going to be looking for. And explain what the high dynamic range is. So the high dynamic range is where we're getting into much more color gradation. We're getting um, better lights and darks and shadows and, and more colors to give us uh, the blues in the sky have more depth and appeal. Um, goes with the 2020 color space that we've expanded to. Um, we were talking earlier, I'm not saying that I watch Game of Thrones. However, I've heard that if you watch Game of Thrones, there are such deep shadows in that, that if they were to move to that high dynamic range, um, I could certainly get a much better image to where um, I see more detail in that picture. Um, but I wouldn't watch it. I, I hear it, you know, just say. But so I think those are the things that really have the impact that the customer base is going to desire. And they may get confused along the way thinking that 4K solves all those problems when that, it, it doesn't necessarily. Okay. Thomas, is, it, is HDR something that is affected when you start com compressing? I'm, I'm assuming it does. Yeah, so, you know, high, so high dynamic range really gives us uh, brighter brights, more details in the darks, and it, you know, it's pretty interesting to see. Um, what, I, what I like to look at is fire in HDR. If you've ever seen a fire in a fireplace, you know, parts of it are really, really bright, and they're incredibly, uh, 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 you know, they, they have incredible color concentration, and then parts are just completely dark, and you can't see that with the standard uh, uh, 709 color uh, space and, and luminance curves that we use today. Uh, the, the challenge is, how do you move from today's 1,000 to 1 uh, dynamic range of luminance that we, we have on television and even streaming and take that up to a 10,000 to 1 dynamic range uh, so that instead of today when we're grading up to about 100 candelas per meter squared on, on television programs, we say we can take that all the way out to 1,000 candelas per meter squared or maybe even 4,000 candelas per meter squared depending on, on how, um, how you feel about it. Um, so, uh, and also through that entire range of luminosity, not have any banding, have enough uh, coding bits so that even in the darks, you're not seeing banding uh, between similar dark levels. Uh, generally, this is going to require 10 bits of precision and not with the same uh, gamma curve that we use today for television, but with something new. For, for, there's something called the, the PQ or perceptual quantizer curve, and the BBC also has another curve as well. Uh, but these different luminance, uh, electro-optic transfer function is the, is the term of art, basically going from a coded value to the actual optical output of the television. Uh, so we're going to need 10 bits for this. Uh, so for instance, uh, I suspect Ultra HD Blu-ray is going to end up being 4, 422 subsampled because you really can't see the lower, cro the lo lower color resolution uh, when you do 422 subsampling. So that's reasonable. Uh, but there'll have to be 10 bits of resolution in each of the pixels. So that pops up the compression uh, requirements a little bit, maybe 10, but maybe only 10 or 20 percent more than, the, uh, than an SDR version mm -hmm. at the same quality level. At the same quality level. Okay, very good. All right, uh, we're going to open this up for questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir? So you talked about UHD higher bandwidth requirement that can 
time not to reach. What do you think about HD with HDR? Do you have any business intentions to support? Do you think there is any business to deliver that, whether it's streaming or broadcast? Well, we are investigating this. In fact, I just shot some uh, high dynamic range footage of a NASCAR event a few weeks ago, and we're just in the process of grading it. I'll tell you though what the challenge is, is that you know, our film friends can spend a couple of months and do post-production on something, and they can tweak it up. They've got their $500 an hour colorists in a room. They spin dials. They make everything look pretty. Life of Pi in HDR is the most amazing thing you've ever seen. Can we do that for an NFL game? I don't know. Uh, so the first step we're doing is to try to take some test footage of uh, sports and then try to see whether it is uh, compelling enough that we're going to put the energy into trying to figure out how we could do high dynamic range in real time while simultaneously having a standard dynamic range product because not everybody's going to have an HDR TV on day one. In fact, right now almost no one does. I think Samsung will be releasing them shortly. Uh, but right now, there's nothing out there, so we'd have to have two separate products. Like, you know, you remember stereoscopic 3D and 2D, and then there was a time when we had HD and SD separate uh, productions. We'll have to see how that works out. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. Tom, so there's a handful of companies that are looking at HDR right now. I'll call them alliances, for lack of a better term. Uh, can you give me your, not sponsor's opinion, but your personal opinion as to which of these you think might be in the lead? Well, oh, the UHD Alliance, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're all looking at slightly different aspects. I, I think everyone agrees that, you know, we, we know the resolution, right? Uh, we know HDR is interesting. We know wide color gamut is interesting as well. We haven't really touched on this, the, the BT2020 color space that is actually a wider color space than the 709 color space we use in television. Uh, that's something else that folks want to achieve as well. I think they're all going about it a different way. I, I don't think there's a horse race. I think that there are, are different people who are coming at different parts of the problem. And I think, I think it's, it's all going to be, I think they're all, we'll all come together and solve the problem coherently. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. He's asking for a, a roadmap on, on 4K delivery. Yeah, I can, I can throw some ideas out in there. I mean, so look, 4K is it's on the air today on cable channels in South Korea. So it's already there. It's, it's possible. It takes a lot of bits, um, and, but it, it certainly is possible to do 4K today. Again, standard dynamic range, uh, standard uh, color gamut. You can do that today pretty easily. You just got to throw you know, 30 plus megabits per second at the problem. Uh, the production elements of it are not, not that tough either. Uh, a lot of cameras today, we're now seeing a lot of 4K production cameras with two third inch CCDs, so we actually have reasonable depth of field. Um, so it is certainly possible to shoot 4K uh, events today, and it's possible. And I think 4K will be, become a more normal camera type for production going in the next couple of years. Uh, it'll be like a no brainer. You may be using an HD output of it, but it'll be 4K capable. So uh, the, the production switchers, right now, uh, a lot of people have the ability to take a production switcher that has four uh, MEs, and you get one 4K ME out of that. So they're, the, all of the vendors who are working in this area are enabling people to do 4K, but at a lot less density of devices than, uh, than they're used to with HD. Um, so the, but when does it actually get on the air? I wouldn't be surprised if some uh, multi-channel uh, video provider you know, has it out by the end of the year. It wouldn't surprise me if there was a, a, ch a channel here and a channel there. Uh, but the bigger question is when does it become the normal thing that everybody does? Uh, it's, it's a little unclear to me. And I'll say uh, this, this issue about how close you have to sit to your television to see 4K resolution makes me think that there might be some value in looking at 1080p 120 frames per second. Because when you go from 60 to 120, you have less motion blur in things like high action sports, which means you actually see higher resolution because there's less blur. And the fact is, I don't think we're going to have Americans sitting closer. This is one of those things you say, and then people will come back and say, you're, oh, 20 years later, oh, you're nuts. I don't think Americans will be sitting much closer in three picture heights to their television, which makes me think 1080p 120 might actually be a better solution. 
But again, we're, we're weighing all these different uh, potentials and we're doing test shoots right now. Uh, but for, for Fox Television, it's a ways out. So I'd want to weigh in on what he just said. I think, I think you're right, absolutely, is from the, um, from the electronic side of it, from the scientific side. Um, however, I think that the customer base is going to demand this. Um, I can get 4K YouTube. Now, to me, that's not a great achievement. To my daughter, who is the next up and coming generation, it is everything. So um, I think it's two pronged. I think one, the consumer has caught on to the 4K buzz and it's great and they want it. They're not sure why and they're not sure what it means. I think the other piece of it is from display manufacturers and from product manufacturers, I need you to buy a new display. So if I'm a, if I'm a display manufacturer, I know you love your 1080p and it's working great. I'm not making money that way. I need you to buy a new display. I need to bring you a new technology. So I think you're gonna see this driven more from the consumer side of the market and from the manufacturing side of wanting to continue to increase revenues. That they're going to, um, they're going to really push this envelope. I think we're on the cusp. There are so many things right now that are unanswered, that are variable with 4K, with high dynamic range, with color gamuts. Um, it's interesting times. And I think we will see a lot more of it settle down in the very near future. But I would say 4K is coming, 8K, 16K, probably not too far behind um, in the future. But that's sort of where I think that whole thing I have an even, an even more yeah. cynical view of the same statement. Yeah. <laughs> Was that cynical? Uh, no, no. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> wait, just, it's just real, wait. It's realistic. Just think, wait. Yeah. <laughs> imagine the following scene. Your, your, your best buddy calls you up and he says, hey, man, I just came home from Best Buy. I just got this great new TV. It was $4,000. It's a 72-inch Samsung. Uh, you, and it's two millimeters thick. You got to come see this thing. And you go over to his house, and he's got it hung on the wall by the by the Geek Squad. It's got its power cables hanging out down to the floor where you can see them. Uh, and he's tuned in to some standard definition channel with like widescreen stretch mode on. <laughs> I, I I've contend, been in that house. <laughs> I contend that, that that although although the science is absolutely right, picture heights and visual acuity. Uh, that, that there are an awful lot of consumers out there that, that just sort of react to these, to these buzzwords in a certain way. And, you know, at Best Buy, you probably are within one and a half picture heights of the TV. And there's a man there saying, you know, this one's got four times the resolution of that old piece of junk. I really think you should go this way. And, and TV manufacturers need a way to move sets. Um, so I, I think there's going to be some of that. Um, in, a, in a slightly less cynical version of the same thing, uh, I think when we get to a high dynamic range place, that technology, having seen the demos myself, I think that is going to move televisions. Um, when people see good high dynamic range content, I mean, it's today any of you can look at a television and then look at a real scene, and you know, you don't, I don't have to tell you which one's the TV and which one's real life, that, that's the TV, and somehow, and somehow you just know that. Uh, when you look at a high dynamic range image, it, in my experience, it can get a little confusing on the right set. Um, and that's, I think, going to be, people will see that and people will get that. And that doesn't rely on these resolution problems of, look, in reality, I sit 14 feet from my 50-inch TV. I don't see 4K resolution there. Okay, so if, if you're a content creator, right, and, and you're looking to get this stuff out into the net and, and on, you know, trying to, uh, talking about streaming here, is it a better use of, of your funds and of your capital to go down the road of maybe 1080p, you know, to Thomas's? Point one twenty, and and focus on getting that high dynamic range production aspect to it, rather than worry about the four K part, or maybe do both. Well, I think it's tough because the standard dynamic range market is going to be there for a long time. So if you're making content, you know, my my suggestion would be you know, a lot a lot of people do this today. You know, shoot raw, you know, grade it for the market that's there, and hold on to that stuff. And later, if there's an HDR market, you can go back and do an HDR grade because the raw has well as much information as your camera can give it, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly, they're, they're, you know, yeah, Sony F55, it's got 14 stops uh, of dynamic range. You know, that's, that's as, as much as you, you need. Uh, it's got all kinds of color capabilities, so you can make a, a wide color gamut grade if you need to as well. So, I mean, that would be my suggestion. Li live is going to be 
so much harder. <laughs> well, yeah. That's, that's going to be the tough part. And of course, you know, for, for us, uh, you know, especially live sports, uh, that's, that's really what pays the bills these days. Plus, you asked, should, should we focus on, you know, dynamic range instead of resolution? I think at this point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know the broadcast gear that well, but you mentioned some things. Uh, in the pro AV space, in the consumer TV space, there's hardly any premium for 4K these days. Uh, my product line, we don't charge any more for 4K. Uh, LG TVs, they told me they're commercial displays. They're planning to charge a 10 to 15% premium for 4K over 1080p this year. And that margin is going to shrink. So, yeah. so yeah, maybe you should focus your resources on, on high dynamic range or higher 120 hertz frame rates, but you don't even have to do that at the expense of resolution necessarily. Well, and, and saying to what Melissa said, the CE uh, manufacturers have been throwing us a whole bunch of interesting curveballs recently. Mm -hmm. Stereoscopic TV came out, and we were like, I don't know if people are ready for that. No, 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 no. Stereoscopic 3D is going to work. Nah, it did not work. 4K. Gotcha. So 4, 4K, <laughs> Surprise. 4K came out, you know, and we said, look, it is probably a little bit ahead of the curve, but we'll catch up to it, but it's not quite ready. And then this year at CES, of course, it was high, high dynamic range and wide color gamut. What will next CES be? Will it be 120 frames per second? You know, maybe it'll be high frame rate. That'll you be you heard it here first, first, folks. It's That's gonna right. be smell-o-vision. Smell-o-vision, there you go. <laughs> oh, please but, but by me, I will, I will tell you, we, we do not go to the CE manufacturers and say, hey, you guys have to do th this or you have to do that, no, no, I, okay? I believe you. We, they, they do things and we try, we try to do what we can to have something that makes money for us um, at the end of the day, uh, regardless of what they're putting out there. That makes sense, all right, go ahead. Uh, behind you and then you. So, so uh, I understand the limitation on the you know, carrier network. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, and I haven't really studied this much of my scenario yet, maybe I can after. On the broadcast uh, television, on, on the air, can they do 4K? Can we do 4K over the air? You can't do good 4K. Okay. okay. Now, like I said, look, there are people streaming what, what they call 4K at 15 megabits per second, and a, a studio executive, not a Fox executive, but another studio, said, "Look, at 4K at 15 megabits per second probably looks worse than HD." Okay. So, you know, you can put out as many pixels as you want, but you can't necessarily put out the resolution. Uh, so let's let's be honest. If we're talking about eventually getting to 20 megabits per second, and that that's not today's HEVC technology, but this is 2017, 2018's HEVC technology, ATSC 3.0, which is going to be the new uh, digital television standard in the U.S., should be able to deliver 24, 25 megabits per second with no problem. Our current DTV uh, realm is 19 megabits per second, so it's, it's going to be a little bit tighter to fit into 19 megabits per second in, the, in our six megahertz channels with what we have today. So I'd say it probably has to wait for ATSC 3.0's new modulation techniques to get over, over, physically over the air. So how much can they go on the, on the air? What's the, the length, uh, uh, How much can you saying over the air bandwidth? Over the air bandwidth today is 19 megabits per second. And again, with ATSC 3.0, you have multiple coding options that can change your coverage area. But if you're trying to get equivalent coverage to what you have today, it's going to be 24, 25 megabits per second. So they could come and, I mean, you could feel pressure as a, you know, a carrier from over the air, uh, air uh, broadcast, potentially. I, I'm not sure. Doing it sooner, I mean, they, so they can potentially do it sooner. You say, oh, you're saying you know, like multi-channel provide, like you know, cable and yeah, yeah, cable people can do it. To, again, they're doing it in South Korea. They could do it here today. Uh, Direct TV, Echo, uh, a Dish, all those folks. Yeah, they certainly could do it. They have to make the question: Are they going to throw 30 megabits plus at a at a channel that you know? What's the revenue proposition? Right? All right, real quick, last last question, then we got to go. What's preventing 4K from being the last 3D, Melissa? Well, I, I, I think, uh, so the 3D folks, yeah. There were so many problems with the whole 3D concept going into the consumer television, into the consumer market. Um, nobody wants to wear the glasses. Um, I think 4K, because of the marketing hype, because of the promises, um, I get better quality in theory. I get better color. I mean, that's what the consumer's expecting. I'm getting a much better image. So um, I believe the consumer is gonna say yes, they want that, just like they wanted the 1080p when we went high def. I want it because it's the latest, greatest. I get better images. I have better images now by far than I did with standard def. And now the promise of the marketing is I'm gonna get 
even more. So I think the 4K is certainly going to come. The marketing aspect of it has been very strong, and the consumer knows what it is. So I think you will see the 4K come to market, um, unlike 3D. And I'll say there, there will be a market for ultra high def, uh, these downloads through the Secure Content Storage Association. There will be a market through mm -hmm. the ultra high def Blu-ray. How big that market is, yeah, I, I, I can't say, but I'm sure there will be a market for people who really want to watch the highest quality feature films out there. It's the, kind of the rest of the ecosystem that, that I, I'm a little bit more concerned about, the, the live, live television aspect of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of economically, there's, there's sort of no going back uh, from the CE perspective. You know, with, with 3D, we could say, you know what, this didn't work. We're going to quit including the glasses. We're going to quit paying for glasses. Uh, an LCD TV is just a bunch of transistors printed on a piece of glass. Um, and, and we know from Moore's Law that we don't, we don't print fewer transistors in the same space. We print more. Uh, so for the CE manufacturers, over time, uh, 4K is essentially a free technology that's easy to sell. Uh, so, of course, they're going to go with it, and they're going to stick with it for a long time. And now the only interesting question is, what, what do we do with all those pixels? That 4K displays make great computer monitors. Yep. Okay. Yes, they do. You can do. They it's do. awesome. Okay. So. They do. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.